I'm a firm believer that if you have insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia or related conditions, the low carb space is a really good space to sit in. We are looking at implementing a carbohydrate reduction, whole food based approach using the health coach approach and community support initiatives in the primary care setting done either by GPs, health coaches, nurses, dietitians, whoever, which is a very, very different model. We kind of try to move from the pharmaceutical model to the lifestyle medicine model. Um, so it's the industrial manufactured process that manipulates food or what was once known as food into food like substances or items that is that is definitely contributing in some way to metabolic dysfunction but we go through our lives believing that carbohydrate is the main energy source and i guess you know it is if you eat predominantly carbohydrate but if you shift your macronutrient proportions and you you reduce your carbohydrate and you up your fat content your body metabolically it shifts metabolically to use different fuel sources so fat is a really, really good fuel source. Reducing carbohydrate should be a priority for people. Optimizing protein, and when I say optimizing, it literally means way more than the guidelines suggest. And then the rest of your calories should be fat. And typically, the rest of those calories end up being... Hey there, welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. You'll find me here every week talking health, well-being and self-improvement. And if you're enjoying these episodes, please show your support by clicking that subscribe button if you've not already done so. You can also share news of this podcast with other people who you think might enjoy these episodes too. And if you're on YouTube, join the over 2,600 subscribers we've amassed in the last nine months. We're aiming for 3,000 subscribers in the coming weeks. Can you help me get there? Now, today I'm joined by dietitian, author, and researcher Dr. Karen Zinn. We ask how much, in terms of carbohydrates, should we be eating per day so as to remain healthy and not fall victim to insulin resistance? We discuss Dr. Zinn's view that recommended daily allowances for protein intake are far too low. We ask how much, by the way, of healthy fats should we be eating, whether we are trying to lose weight or indeed maintain a healthy weight. We also talk about the shortcomings of focusing too much on monitoring blood sugar levels at the expense of our insulin levels. Plus, we explore the consumption of dietary fibre and ask if it helps to suppress blood sugar spikes caused by sugary foods and lots more besides. I hope you enjoy. Well, let's start by talking about carbohydrate intake. It seems we're all ingesting way too many carbohydrates and this is what's driving metabolic disease in the form of obesity, inflammation, insulin resistance, diabetes and lots more besides. So can we start by just getting your take on this first of all? I definitely think we're eating too many carbohydrates. Um, We can delve down a little bit deeper there. I think we're eating too many poor quality carbohydrates. Certain people are eating um too many poor quality carbohydrates, but I think, or not about and, I think it also goes beyond carbohydrate. I I think the whole driving of metabolic disease is broader than just carbohydrates, but if we want to start with carbohydrates, um, I'm your girl, because I'm a real advocate of um, whole food carbohydrate reduction for most of the population, really. It's interesting because I've been talking to various uh, experts and specialists on that whole low-carb lifestyle, for want of a better word, in recent months. And would would you go so far as to say that you would be a proponent of the ketogenic approach or is that label a a step too far, possibly? Is it just the case of, look, it's low-carb and let's not put labels on it? You know, I think that's probably the, the, the crux of the whole story. And if we were probably a little bit more um, gentle, if you like, in our approach and our terminology, I think the critics wouldn't be critics and um, there'd be a lot more people aligned with the approach. So I'm a firm believer that if you have insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia or related conditions, the low-carb space is a really good space to sit in. I do work with clients um, using the ketogenic approach, but I, I think that to be in nutritional ketosis, to have high circulating ketones at the level of the brain, for therapeutic action, having 
having neurological conditions or brain-related perturbations, I guess, would be the best use of the ketogenic diet. Now, certainly if someone with type 2 diabetes wants to go on the ketogenic diet, by all means, I'm not going to stop them. Or I might stop them, but um, if they're going to stick to it, I'm not going to stop them. But I think the biggest problem with keto, so to speak, is that it's, it is pretty extreme. It's really severe. And um, anyone can do it <clears throat> for a month, but not anyone and everyone can do it for for, for lifelong. So um, I think I think that that's the crux of it. I think if we push people towards keto, and you know that even that word um, gets people's bristles up, really. Um, I, I think we might be doing them and the academic and practitioner community a disservice long term. So we just, it, it's not like I'm anti-keto at all. We just need to be very clear about which population groups we think are suited to low-carbon keto. And I also think that terminology is key. And, you know, it, about 10 years ago, we talk about um, low-carb, low-carb, and low-carb has become a, oh, it's just a, it's just a fad, low-carb. So we kind of move to a more sort of medical, academic term, carbohydrate restriction. Um, and it seemed to kind of lift the level a little bit in certain people's eyes. And now we're moving towards carbohydrate reduction because the word restriction um, implies exactly that. And, and while it is restriction, I think the word carbohydrate reduction is, is gentler. So it's about how we pitch these ideas to to the wider world in terms of how they accepted. But um, to get back to the, the root of your question, I sort of sit for most of my patients in the, in the carbohydrate reduction, low carb space. And if there are clients that um, don't fare as well as they want to fare in that space, or I've got clients with more severe neurologically related conditions, I would work with them in the ketogenic space. I spoke with uh, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who is ve very prevalent in that uh, keto therapeutic space. Uh, I spoke to him the other day and he, he was talking uh, about the same thing, about it being very difficult to stick with if you're doing it just purely from a lifestyle standpoint because it, it's so low in, in carbohydrates, whereas it's very effective, uh, as you said, in relation to some uh, neurological uh, disorders. Uh, I, I know it has a history of uh, being used to treat epilepsy, for example, the, the, the ketogenic diet. But there seems to be also that stigma attached to, to that keto word, which triggers people, as you mentioned already. And I think that probably that stigmatization does uh, that whole low carb movement a disservice as well, because I think people probably yeah. misunderstand what keto is and what low carb is, and they stigmatize the whole lot. 100%. And the other thing that, um, that goes hand in hand with when you suggest keto, people think, and, and rightly so, the original ketogenic diet for um, for epilepsy application was very low in carbohydrate and very, very high in fat and particularly saturated fat. So that initial definition of the ketogenic diet for therapeutic epilepsy has carried over. So people think that, oh, if I want to lose weight or reverse my type 2 diabetes, I've got to literally like cut it all out in terms of carbs and I've got to pour cream on everything. I've got to put MCT and butter in my coffee in the morning, um, and I've got to eat cheese and bacon until the cows come home. And you know and that for some people that can be totally fine and not problematic, but I think for other people that it can be problematic. I think the area of lipidology is is an area of science that we don't know enough about to um, to make hard and fast rules with confidence. But we, we're getting to know um, a lot more, um, and and the whole LDL kind of. Um, the era of, of LDL cholesterol it being <laughs> being bad for you and causing well cardiovascular disease. Then is it's more nuanced than just um, you know the old diet heart um, and lipid hypothesis. So we we are understanding a lot more, but we, we're not there yet. And I'll just give you a classic example of um, so I work at AUT as a, a researcher, and we we've got this government funding for well, three years to. Um, to do implementation science in primary care, which is our doctor's doctor's clinics, looking at pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes and looking at a better way to deliver healthcare for these individuals and communities. Um, and, 
I- implementation science, for those who might not know, is it's very different from a, a controlled trial where you come on a, you know, you come on an intervention for twelve weeks and you have a control group and everything's very set and you measure it before and after. And it's it's very um, very clinical and clear cut and well controlled. Implementation science is when you try something um, in a real life setting, a medical community setting, and you evaluate it as it goes along. Um, and you modify as you know accordingly as it goes. So we're looking at after some um, evaluation with some people we work closely with, some some doctors, we are looking at implementing um, a carbohydrate reduction, whole food based approach using he- the health coach approach. So using health coaching and community support initiatives in the primary care setting, done either by GPs, health coaches, nurses, dietitians, whoever. Which is a very, very different model, and um, we're kind of trying to move from the pharmaceutical model to the lifestyle medicine model, um, and uh, medication reduction and reversing type or remitting type two diabetes um, and prediabetes is the, is the goal. And it's really interesting having conversations with the medical teams, and he's like, "Oh, it's keto, I'm not interested." And suddenly, when they when they really begin to understand and upskill. Um, on what it's actually all about. It's just eating whole food. And if you truly eat whole food, it will probably end up being much lower in carb, slightly high in protein, and um, probably slightly high in fat than the kind of traditional guidelines, but better quality. And once they begin to understand that you don't need to ship in caramels of cream by the dozen, then, you know, they start coming around and go, well, actually, that's a really good model. I'm in. So we started off by talking about high levels of overconsumption of carbohydrates uh, based on uh, uh, consuming a, a highly processed diet, uh, which was very, very heavy in those, those uh, carbohydrates. So the result of that was a metabolic dysfunction. We're talking obesity, we're talking diabetes, we're talking uh, insulin resistance, inflammation. Uh, these are the, the general conditions that are, are a direct result of too much carbs. Would that be the, the right analysis? Whether it's the result of too much carbs, um, which which indicates that it's causal, uh, that's I don't think that is settled in science yet. But I I think there are a lot of things that might contribute to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. But certainly we know that when you are in those contexts, then the management of them is is um, best applied by a reduction of carbohydrate. I think there would be a lot of people that would say that high carbohydrate diets, poor quality high carbohydrate diets have resulted and led to these conditions. Um, I wouldn't be <laughs> I wouldn't be brave or bold or stupid enough to pin it on that exactly, but I, I certainly think that that it has a it has a, a hand to play for sure. What are the other contributory factors then do you think underpinning metabolic disease if it's not exclusively at the, that uh, huge increase in carbohydrate consumption that we've seen in recent decades? I think that ultra-processed foods, and this is a big buzzword at the moment, um, but it, it it is true that ultra-processed foods are contributing to to chronic disease in a massive way. And the interesting thing is, you might, you know, you, your listeners might be thinking, well, ultra-processed foods means high carbohydrate foods anyway with lots of sweets and you know biscuits and everything but it's not necessarily just carbohydrate that formulates an, an ultra processed food so it's the it it's the it's the process itself um, that can contribute to to some of the gut microbiome dysregulation and some of the hormone dysregulation that you get inside the body um, so some of the processes some of the additives um, so it's the industrial manufactured process that manipulates food or what was once known as food into food like substances or items um, that is that is definitely contributing in some way to metabolic dysfunction. But I also think you know nutrition is is just one piece of the puzzle. But, you know we hear the, we hear these stories, we see these stories every day of people who eat terribly, um, but they live to to you know late 90s and then you hear those people who are just you know absolutely beautiful eaters everything's organic and natural and and then um they had some terrible disease earlier so there's there's more to it and I, I certainly think that um the lifestyle in a general sense is important so exercise movement general movement 
um, resistance exercise, particularly for females, um, is, is very important. But I think that one of the biggest um, one of the biggest things is stress, um, and also sleep is in there as well. But I think you know sleep you can sleep you can measure, and everyone's got these Fitbits and um, garlands and um, aura rings and devices that can measure sleep. But stress is that kind of insidious. A variable that you can't really measure. You can't get a blood measure and go, whoops, I need to do something about this. So I think stress kind of create, creeps in, into people's lives in such a way that they don't realize it until either someone points it out or until it's too late. And, you know, stress is not all that bad. Acute stress, like that adrenaline rush before you do a, a presentation to a group of people or before you um, you run the 100 meters at the Olympics or something. That that stress is that hormetic stress is is really important, but it's when it crosses over into chronic stress, that's the that's the that's the problem. And I think stress has a an enormous role to play, but I'm not sure of the intricacies and what happens internally. Um, but I'm convinced that's the killer. It's so complicated. There are so many different factors. I'm glad you said sleep because uh, I chatted with a cardiologist only the other day who said the exact same thing about the importance of, of sleep. And, and obviously, if you get a good quality sleep uh, on a regular basis, the the chance of you suffering from the uh, the stress and the cortisol that you spoke about is diminished. Can we talk about the macronutrient breakdown then as far as you're concerned when it comes to an optimum diet? We're consuming too many carbohydrates. I know you're a fan of a low-carb, high-fat diet. So could we look at the the breakdown of uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, which I'm interested in looking at as well? Yes, I think I've sort of done myself a disservice in in a little way by by, by being the LCHF dietitian, low-carb, healthy fat. I, it is healthy fat, not high fat. I, I'm, I don't think high fat is the way to go. Not because I think it's um, detrimental, but because I think when you look at the importance of nutrients, I think protein um, should be up there. Not necessarily high protein, but higher protein. I think protein should be a priority for a lot of people. So reducing carbohydrates should be a priority for people optimizing protein and when I say optimizing it literally means way more than the guidelines suggest and then the rest of your calories should be fat and typically the rest of those calories end up being higher than our current dietary guidelines suggest so it is higher fat and healthy fat but it's again it's like that keto where when you say low carb high fat you know you can feel people's bristles starting because it's not necessarily high fat it's just higher than our guidelines. So in terms of macronutrient, I don't really work very well in percentages because they're just meaningless unless you've got this um, mental calculator going on in your brain, which very few people have. So I think in the carbohydrate space, I like to work in terms of grams um, per individual. So, you know, if if we are guided to eat sort of 250, 300 plus grams of carbohydrate in a day as your general guidelines, I think that um, the majority of people, when I say the majority of people, uh, when you look at our population, the majority of our population has insulin resistance to some to some degree, even if you can't see it. Um, I, I think potentially, definitely under 130 grams per day, but even under 100. So between kind of that 50 and 100 grams is where I sort of work a lot of the time with, with, with my clients. I think if they went closer to 50 grams a day, they would potentially get better outcomes. But again, I'm very, very, I, I'm, I'm very mindful that if they, if they do this, they've got to do this for the long haul. So they've got to make it sustainable. So it might be for some people they'd like to do 50 or below, but actually sitting at about 80 to 100 might, might be a good idea. Um, again, for, for athletes, which is a slightly different, well, it's a completely different population group really so they can go very low or they can go um a a lot higher but still be closer to ketosis just because of the sheer fuel utilization and adaptation that they get so we'll kind of put those to the side for the moment so you've got between sort of 50 and 100 grams of carbohydrate protein so protein is an interesting thing because our general guidelines and this is one guideline that is uh, common across all countries which is sort of a little bit unusual in that our RDI or RDA, whichever country you're in, 
um, suggests that we need to have 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight, which is woeful. Um, yeah, if you want to live in a state of, um, you know, teetering between deficiency and not, then go for it. But um, I think that's I think that's woeful for most people. So um, I like to sit around the 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight. Um, but of course, that becomes complicated when you've got someone who's really overweight. So I kind of look at 1.5 grams per kilogram ideal body weight. So that might sit between anywhere between 90 and, uh, and 120 grams of the carbohydrate for a typical female and um, maybe 120 to 150 or 60 for a typical male. I don't want to say typical because I just don't think that, you know, that always exists. But um, it's probably if you need to, if you need to box it into a percentage, um, I'd probably say it's on the higher end of the maybe 25 to 30, 35% of the diet coming from protein. And then again, the rest of the rest of the calories comes from fat, which um, can be, again, depending on what your total calorie intake can be anywhere between 70 and 200 grams of, of, of fat, depending. Um, but that might be for some people around kind of 50 to 55, maybe 60 percent fat. So it's still higher fat, but your your protein is prioritized. And because you've got three macronutrients, um, it's obvious that if you manipulate one, the others get manipulated as well. That's why percentages are a bit kind of messy. Um, but certainly if you've got total calories to deal with, if you want to be in a state of weight maintenance or in a state, a state of weight loss, which is again another context, um, your carbohydrate and your protein are the important ones to start with and then your fat um, comes in to match what calorie intake you, you would want to be at. I hope that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. No, it, it, yeah. it really does. And I'm interested though, just from a logistical standpoint and just a real world standpoint, when it comes to things uh, like uh, consuming of fats, as we said already, fat can intimidate people. It can scare people. Any mention of cholesterol at all will send people into a tizzy at times. And so what I want to find from you, because you're the expert in this, what are the great sources, the best sources of dietary fat that people can get their hands on? So I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that um, people think they've got to add fat to get fat. And what they don't realize is that there's fat built in to most of our foods, particularly our protein foods. So our meat, fish, chicken, eggs, milk and dairy, they all, and, um, and nuts and seeds and, you know, legumes and whatever, they all, they all come with some fat um, included in that. So um, as an example, the, if you look at making, making up an omelet in the morning, there the are a couple of ways you can do this. So the typical keto cowboy way would be, Throw um, throw a, a good amount of butter into the pan. Make sure you have a a little um, a little bite off the corner of the butter before you in, put it into the pan. Like this is um, this is keto cowboy, right? So throw throw it in there, and then mix your eggs in there, and then you add your cheese, and you add your bacon, and then you got to add your cream, um, and that becomes a fat fest really because you've got added, added, added. Um, and you've got inherent, you've got fat that comes from cheese, you've got fat that comes from eggs, and fat that comes from bacon. Or you can do it another way, where you put a little bit of butter, maybe a, a teaspoon or, or, or two, or maybe even a tablespoon, depending on how many you're cooking for. Put your eggs in there, hopefully put the vegetables in there, um, and you can you can probably leave it at that for some people, because you've got enough fat in, in the butter and in the eggs um, to you know, to, to, to warrant a, a meal that's going to be satiating because, of course, protein is the most satiating nutrient anyway. You've got the vegetables in there for the fiber and a little bit of fat in there. So the whole meal becomes a satiating meal or a meal that keeps you full. So, so I'd encourage people to, um, to think about if they were eating full fat animal sources, so meat, chicken with skin, um, fish, including fatty fish, like salmon, sardines, mackerel, that, I mean, that's like top of the list for me in terms of good quality fats um, in, in, in foods. So meat, fish, chicken, um, eggs, 
Uh, what else have we got? Dairy products. You can get full fat dairy products. There's plenty of fat in there. Um, then you can also go low fat dairy products. I don't recommend going low fat dairy products, really, because it sort of it just seems a little bit counterintuitive. But for certain people who want to optimize their protein um, and use more added fats, so if you want to add more olive oil and more avocado um, to your meals, then you might want to choose leaner meats. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to go. You have to take the skin off the chicken and all that kind of stuff, because then that's going back to kind of the you know the eighties dietary guidelines type. Well, actually, no, it is it's still current to be fair. Um, but I would I would say natural fats in food um, are important. Things like um, monounsaturated fats in avocado, nuts, olive oil are really important. Omega three fats um, from from fatty fish, as I mentioned. You can also get omega three from eggs and from from meats as well particularly if they are finished a certain way um and and you can get them from plant sources as well like like flax seeds and um, hemp seeds and things so i hope i've covered that yeah I've covered that hopefully i will say that added fats i would encourage would be things like olive oil avocado oil macadamia oil butter uh, ghee that kind of stuff i am um, of the um, community that believes that seed oils have a role to play in um, in inflammation. I still think we need more evidence to convince the rest of the world that this is the case, but I, um, I am of the belief that we want to avoid seed oils. They are highly manufactured, highly processed, um, and we should avoid them within reason. Yeah. How do you make the consumption of dietary fat acceptable to somebody who's looking to drop fat, who's looking to lose weight, because it seems counterintuitive. I'm, I'm trying to rid myself of X amount of weight, and yet you're telling me to consume uh, fat at the same time. So how, how do you how, how do you communicate that message to people? How do you get them to understand that? Yeah, and I think that brings in what I what I just said in terms of focusing on the fact that there's fat in foods. So when you say to people, you've always been eating fat in foods anyway. Um, so you just need to make sure that the, that the choices are um, are aligned with, with what you want to do. And I think once you, like if you're just talking macronutrients with an individual, they'll go away and they won't know what, you know, how, how it all works. So I work really practically um, with, with my clients and I design uh, meal plans with them. So we talk through the meals and when you talk through things like um, an omelette with some vegetables cooked in a little bit of butter or olive oil if you like I say if, if they've got a problem with the whole saturated fat thing I explain to them why I think it's not a problem but if they still have a problem with it then we don't we don't gravitate towards that we use things like olive oil um, and um, and sort of mono and, and polyunsaturated fat focused but when you talk to them about a, a, a veggie omelette cooked in a little bit of fat when you talk to them about a big salad, lots of greens, um, good quality protein, and a little bit of avocado and olive oil, it doesn't raise any kind of um, issues. Like people don't go, oh, you know, that, that, oh, that, that sounds dangerous. But the minute you say you put five tablespoons of mayonnaise on, they go, oh, well, you know, what about that? So you, you literally have to um, talk them through and, and educate them and understand and get them to understand that when it comes to weight loss, I mean, there's three, really, well, there, there are lots of things that are important, but I guess one, it's keeping carbs down, and two, it's keeping calories under control. So calories do count. I don't care what anyone says, calories do count. You don't have to necessarily count calories, but sometimes if you just eat in this way, um, the weight kind of drops without you having to be a slave to counting. But... Um, but people need to realize if they're doing everything right and they're not losing weight, they're likely eating too many calories. And typically that comes from fat. So I think if you explain these concepts to them, um, and it depends on the literacy, the nutritional literacy level of, of your client. And if they're a client that loves um, apps and loves weighing and measuring, then they're away. They figure it out themselves. They learn a little bit about food composition. They understand you know, calories in well, not calories in, calories out. They understand calorie excess, calorie deficit. It's like a bank account, really. Um, you know, it's either 
see the money in it or or some debt. <laughs> so you can have nice analogies there to explain. And they're away. And other people um, just like, tell me what to eat. You know, tell me what to look out for and tell me what to eat or what not to eat. Um, and, and they get results there. So I think I've probably been lucky in that because I've been in this low carbohydrate game for a little while, about 10 years, people come to me because they know what I do. So they already half sold on the concept. Um, and my role is to just facilitate and apply the diet and, and coach them and things like that. But it's it's more that I'm talking to the health professionals about, you know, upskilling them to talk to their patients that you've got to be a little bit more careful in the whole fat domain. Um, but again, if, you, if you're focusing on whole food natural fats, um, it doesn't seem to be too problematic. You alluded to self-monitoring there, and the at the moment it seems like every other person is acquiring one of those continuous glucose monitors. I don't have one myself, but I did get one of the old-fashioned ones where you have to prick your finger and, and monitor your, your blood. Uh, there, I, I don't have a need for it, and certainly not medically, but I just did it out of pure curiosity because I was talking to people like yourself on this podcast. I, I have heard you speak about the, the downsides and the limiting factor involved in just monitoring your blood glucose levels because it's only a tiny part of the picture. Uh, I know you have said that uh, what is equally as important, if not more so important, is the level of insulin in the system. Could you explain to me about the complexity of insulin and about the the inability of, of science at the moment to be able to monitor insulin on an ongoing basis in the same way as we're monitoring glucose? And why insulin is so much more important, really, than glucose blood sugar levels. Yeah, I think, look, I think glucose and insulin are, are both important, but sometimes glucose, when you see raised glucose in an oral glucose tolerance test, which is which is if you swallow a bunch of sugar and measure your um, measure the, um, how that um, how that presents in in the blood, um, you know, over a two or five hour period. Um, and you see, you know, raised levels of glucose and things, that might already be too late. Um, and this is where insulin comes into it. So um, so a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Catherine Crofts, who was a PhD student of mine, um, really focused her research on this area of hyperinsulinemia. And um, she was able to connect with... Um, the late Joseph Kraft in Chicago and get a massive database of his life, his life's work. He's a pathologist. And I think there was something like 14,000 um, data points there. And um, what she, what she found, so he, he basically um, identified five patterns of, um, of glucose response and insulin response. So he measured insulin for five hours after an oral glucose tolerance test alongside glucose. And what he found was for about two thirds of that population, um, two thirds of that population had normal glucose tolerance test, but in the presence of raised and, and extended, uh, raised for an extended period of time, levels of insulin. So that is something that no one would know um, if you're not measuring insulin. So, so someone who's pregnant will go to the you know, go to the um, provider and have their oral glucose tolerance test and their, their glucose normal and you go, that's totally fine, you you will fine. But what's happening in the background, maybe pregnancy is not the best example because you're going to get some hyper, you're going to get some hyperinsulinemia um, as a natural consequence of pregnancy. But let's say someone who's got um, pre-diabetes and they have an oral glucose tolerance test and it looks normal. And the doctor might go, yep, no, no problem. It's all looking normal. What might be bubbling away is that um, is that they might have very high levels of insulin that takes a longer time to return to baseline. So it's it's like this hidden problem that has not come to um, the the diagnostics and the I guess the the primary care world is is to measure insulin. And I think you know people will say, well, we've got fasting insulin. And we can look at that. If fasting insulin is is you know within a normal range, then then we're fine. But the problem with fasting insulin, well, the problem with insulin itself is um, is that it's probably one of the most labile um, 
variables to measure or blood or blood measure. So it it oscillates and it kind of changes every minute. So if you do probably if you measure fasting insulin um, twenty times over an hour or two, there'll be vastly different measures. So it's not it's just a point in time. Fasting um, insulin is just a point in time and it might be the right point or the wrong point. So it is still used in the whole sort of dying diagnostic management profile, but it's not it's not perfect. In a perfect world, we would have a continuous insulin meter, like we've got a continuous glucose meter or monitor. And that will that's um that's there. We've really got continuous ketone um meters, which I believe have just come on the market, which you know, which will be useful telling us about ketones. But we you know, we'd love to see what's happening with insulin all the time. Um, and particularly post um and post, you know, I guess, whenever whenever blood sugar goes up, whether it's as a result of food or as a result of stress. And when I say stress, it could be the, like acute stress of, you know, jumping into cold water, um, which is meant to be good for you, but, you know, your blood sugar goes up and we, we don't know what, what, that, what that's doing. Hopefully the hormetic stress is going to be beneficial long term. But yeah, I think there's a big question mark around insulin, and in some practices around the world, um, they are doing insulin assays, two-hour insulin assays. So the five-hour time period has been um, sort of back extrapolated into two hours because they, you know, they seem to the two hours seems to be a good proxy of the of the five-hour. So in some practices in the world. Um, doctors are doing two-hour insulin assays, and you can get a better picture of your metabolic health after consuming whatever you consume. Um, but it's few and far between, and it's not it's not really a known thing. I think hyperinsulinemia is a word that's only um, it's only been unleashed really um, in in the scientific community in the last several years. Um, you know, certainly when I was studying my physiology and my dietetics many years ago, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia were not even words I'd ever come across. So the science has definitely moved, but the practice is kind of slow to catch up. So essentially, I suppose then, going back to the, the continuous blood sugar monitors again, blood glucose monitors, if you have one of these and you're monitoring your blood glucose levels all the time, it's academic, really, because of the, the labile and the oscillating nature of insulin. At the same time, it could be all over the place and you could have normal levels of blood glucose, but your insulin could be uh, abnormal throughout the course of the day. So, And that could be problematic, whereas you're not measuring that, so you don't even know that it's problematic. Is that what you're saying? I think it's normal with, with your insulin response, it's normal more so after you have your oral, oral glucose tolerance test. So you want to measure how long it takes for your insulin to return back to, to, to basal or, or, or to normal levels. And I think that's the most important time to look at insulin. I, I think, you know, if that was there as a diagnostic tool and you knew you had hyperinsulinemia, then the management of that it's to reduce your carbohydrate. And then when you are, then let's say that's, that's you and you get a, a continuous glucose monitor and you put it on and you make an effort to have minimal glucose excursions over the day, um, you would you would imagine that your insulin follows as such. So insulin only really, um, um, I mean, insulin oscillates, but really when you get high levels of insulin, it's got to follow glucose, right? It's got to follow glucose. So if you are eating a a diet which is very low in carbohydrate and you're not getting much glucose response, you're getting a mini flat line with a few minimal bumps, um, chances are that your insulin is well controlled. Yeah, so it's more so the insulin problem um, with, with is more in a diagnostic sense after you have an oral glucose tolerance test. That, that's the most important time. Um, I still think having a continuous insulin meter would be a good idea, but it's more so for people, it's more for, so for the diagnostics, not so much the management. And again, when you are managing a condition and you're trying to make sure you get as close to flatline as possible for your blood sugar, um, 
your your insulin should be um, should be low as well, and that's that's typically what happens, and that's why diabetics tend to reverse their type two diabetes because their blood sugar gets um, comes under control, their insulin decreases, and and their metabolic health kind of um, reverses or improves. And of course, insulin is produced by the pancreas in order to offset the spike in blood sugar levels. And whenever we're eating too many high carb foods over a period of months or years, uh, that then can lead to insulin resistance. And then with that comes inflammation and then uh, the metabolic dysfunction that we spoke about at the outset of this conversation. I'm interested to ask you your thoughts on fiber. Does fiber help to offset or mitigate that increase in blood sugar levels if you consume it at the same time? Uh, as the the high carbohydrate food. Yes, I think what's important here is um, you've got glycemic index and you've got glycemic load, and we want to get the overall glycemic load um, as, as as low as possible. We want to keep it down, and the best way to do that is to have less of carbohydrate that will decrease the load. But there are other ways that you can decrease um, the glycemic load, and um, some of those ways are things like um, adding protein to a meal, adding fiber to a meal. And exercising around a meal, um, so that would decrease. You know, you you kind of make sure that your your carbohydrate is let out slowly, but it's still there, right? It's still there. I think again, the better way to to improve your metabolic health is to reduce your overall carbohydrate rather than um, add the other stuff there just to get the, the picture looking a little bit better. So, I mean, like I think fiber. Fiber is really important for for lots of reasons, um, and one of the main reasons is is for the gut microbes, so um, and, and for gut health. So I think um, I think adding fiber, which comes mainly from vegetables, so vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, and seeds. If you want a low carbohydrate diet, the fruit and the legumes are going to be kept to a minimum. Whereas the non-starchy vegetables and the nuts and seeds will, will be higher. And you can get adequate fiber. I mean, no, not adequate. You can get optimal fiber um, from making sure you get enough of these foods. So fiber, I'm a, um, I'm a big fan of fiber, but it's not so much for the reason to improve your glycemic load as well for what it does for your, your gut health. There is a contrary argument um, that you can... You can do with well without fiber, without dietary fiber, um, and the theory there is really related to um, to the short chain fatty acids that you get from fiber. So, um, butyrate is one of the key short chain fatty acids that you get from um, gut microbes munching away on the fiber, right? Um, and 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 that that fuel for the um, for the gut microbes is is what is um, is, is is something that kind of signals a positive outcomes in, in the body, if you like. So if you have no fiber, there is a theory that if you're on the ketogenic diet um, and you have high levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate, well, well, butyrate, the short-chain fatty acid, and beta-hydroxybutyrate sound the same. You think they'd be chemically similar. They're actually not that can make you similar, but they've both got signaling effects in the body. So the idea is that if you've got enough beta-hydroxybutyrate, it basically operates as butyrate might do for gut health and um, and wider implications in the body. Now that is purely a hypothesis. Now let's test that. Um, so, you know, just putting it out there, I, I still think, you know, and like the carnival diet is the classic kind of head scratcher around that, um, you know, and, and that's something it is that it's really, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a public health diet and it will never be as, you know, potentially for a small, very small percentage of the population who need help, um, for certain health conditions. But, um, but I certainly think, I just want to, to, um, to put, to push the value of, um, of fiber and what it does for the body. So your vegetables and your nuts and seeds. Um, a little bit of fruit and legumes, those are really important foods that most people should aim to consume a lot of in their diet. Good. I'm glad I asked now. But So you can't use fibre to uh, to let you off the hook if you want to have something sweet, then essentially is what you're saying. You can't allow fibre to allow you to cheat. Uh, I think that's probably, uh, probably the message I'm going to take from that. Um, <laughs> one final one for you, uh, Dr. Zinn, if I can. You mentioned exercise already. 
Is exercise something that we will associate purely with, with glucose and with sugar consumption? Or can we exercise uh, and use fat as a fuel source instead? Yeah, and I think that, you know, that is another, the world is filled with misconceptions. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that uh, we go through our lives believing that carbohydrate is the main energy source. And I guess, you know, it is if you eat predominantly carbohydrate. But if you shift your macronutrient proportions and you you reduce your carbohydrate and you up your fat content, your body metabolically, it shifts metabolically to use different fuel sources. So fat is a really, really good fuel source. And we know this because if you are, if you find yourself on a, well, you wouldn't find yourself on a desert island, but if you do a, like a, a fast for like a 24-hour fast or a 48-hour fast or longer, um, you are basically using your body fat as its own fuel. So fat has nine calories per gram. It's a very, very, um, it's a very, very good fuel source. And I think the biggest problem is that because we've had a carbohydrate centric diet, and particularly in the athlete world, we've never really given our bodies a chance uh, to to look at fuel utilization from fat and the implications of that. So a typical endurance runner um, would be on sort of eight to ten grams of carbohydrate per kilogram in body weight. So you know, um, if you weigh, if you're weighing eighty kilos, that's you know eight hundred <laughs> eight hundred grams of carbohydrate. It's just I don't know, it's just nonsensical in my head now. Um, but but if you are running a marathon on that, you need to constantly top up that carbohydrate because your muscle glycogen stores need to be topped up um, and if you're running a marathon or an ultra marathon, yes, you will use some of that fuel as as fat. You, you do. You use a tiny little bit of protein. You want to minimize that. Um, but you use predominantly carbohydrate. And if you don't fuel yourself properly with carbohydrate on the hour, every hour, you're going to have a hard time. But if you adapt to a low carbohydrate, higher fat diet, um, you, your mitochondria um, which is kind of the 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 energy currency in, in every in every cell. So it's much more than just the the energy powerhouse. But um, what the mitochondria do is um, adapt so that you can efficiently burn fat as a fuel and not have to top up carbohydrate on the hour every hour. So you are burning fat as you go. And as we know, even the leanest person has. Um, has plenty body fat stores compared to the carbohydrate stores. So it can be pretty efficient in terms of, um, from a practical standpoint, when you are, you know, doing the Ironman or running a marathon, you don't have, have to be a slave to carbohydrate. Um, but, but some research, you know, research that is coming through also suggests that it's really your blood sugar um, regulation that is important during um, endurance events like that. So it's, people think that muscle glycogen emptying is when you hit fatigue. Well, it might be that actually blood sugar um, reduction or hypoglycemia might be more closely related to fatigue. So having a little bit of carbohydrate while you're doing that um, lengthy exercise is actually not a bad thing. Um, uh, and the science is still informing us on that. But it's it's very different to having, you know, like, two gels and a Powerade every hour on the hour, which, you know, apart from, you know, your, your dentist will have a fit if you if you continue doing this for a long time. Well, I've been one of those people who took gels during a race, and I'm just interested to find out from you, what kind of fat source could you rely on during a race, for example, if, if you have if you've gotten your body accustomed to surviving off of fat, during exercise rather than glucose. Yeah, so that's the beauty of it. You're not relying on an external fat source because your body's got it. You're relying on the fat in your adipose tissue. Um, so uh, so that's what's being metabolized for exercise. For exercise. So you'll find that people who've had, who have habitually um, fat adapted to this um, low carbohydrate, high fat way of eating um, they find that they can run marathons and beyond on just fluid and electrolytes alone with a little bit of carbohydrate here and there. Wow. So, yeah, absolutely. The fuel is on your body. So, again, the fluid, sorry, the, the fat is on your body. The fuel is on your body. The, the, the 
the fluid, the electrolytes are still really important. The carbohydrate to top up your blood sugar is important. We're still finding out more about that. Um, what might become important as well is is just calories. So it might be that if you if you're exercising for eight plus hours, you just get hungry and you just want calories. Where you get them from is, dare I say, it, it's almost irrelevant um, because you've got the fat on your body for your fuel. Um, you, if you need a bit of carbohydrate, then you might as well take something to provide you with calories that's got a little bit of a carbohydrate in. So you might have like a, a bar that's got protein and carbohydrate in, um, and you might have one bar every couple of hours or something that might give you 15, maybe 20 grams of carbohydrate rather than the current guideline for high, carbo- high carbohydrate athletes, which is basically, you know, 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate on the hour every hour and sometimes up to 90 grams. So there's a vast difference between having 20 grams of carbohydrate every, you know, three or four hours versus 90 grams every hour. It's it's quite a different um, different way of working. Your intestines would thank you as well, not having to consume so many carbohydrates because it can be very tough on the digestive system. I, I could speak from experience. Um, it, it's such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've been involved in uh, in co-authoring and, and writing several books, one of which is called What the Fat? Fat in, sugar's out, a how to live the ultimate low-carb, healthy fat lifestyle. I'll leave a link to that book uh, in the show notes for this episode. If people want to find out more about your work, where can they go, doctor? So that What the Fat book is, is 10 years old, and I just want to say it was... Um, it, it was really timely. Myself and my colleagues in, in New Zealand, we uh, we wrote the book. It's got science, it's got practice, it's got recipes in it. And it was really it was really the start of the wave, the, the, the low-carbohydrate wave. And, um, and we really helped a lot of people, um, a lot of health practitioners and a lot of people to, to navigate this world in a safe and practical way. So that was the point of it. And we're still seeing these, what the fat books sitting in the GP clinics, um, which is, which is really cool. But anyway, so if anyone wants to get a hold of me, I've got a, a, a what have I got? I've got a full website, karenson.com. I've got my academic page, which is, um, which is AUT, um, Karenson. If you just Google that, you'll find me. And then I've got a, an X or a Twitter, um, page as well. I've got a Facebook page. I'm not that active on that. Uh, social media is kind of like, I just, you know. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Tiresome at the moment. I have no Instagram. My dog has an Instagram page, but I don't. Um, I, it's just too much to do, actually. So if, if anyone wants to find me, as long as you spell my name right, C-A-R-Y-N, Z-I-N-N, you can throw me into Google and you'll find me somehow. Well, listen, we'll pop some of those links to the show notes, as I said. I'm not sure if we'll stick in your dog's Instagram, but uh, leave it with me. Uh, but uh, for, the, for, the, <laughs> for the moment, Dr. Karen Zinn, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you liked it, show your support. Hit that like button, subscribe, and share news of this podcast with other people who you think might enjoy these episodes too. Until next time, stay happy.